All right. So I'm glad that you all were able to make it with us today. Um, we're kind of winding down our series. Uh, we'll be going through the end of March with a few more uh, topics. Favorite topic has been the, the river this year, the fish in the river, the dam in the river, and upcoming in March is um, more the shad in the river. So, all right, so let me introduce our guest today. Jason Higgins is a PhD candidate in history at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. He is currently finishing his dissertation Stars, Bars, and Stripes, a history of incarcerated veterans since the US war in Vietnam. He has recorded nearly 60 interviews for his current project and has been doing oral history for the past decade. He is co-editing a collection titled Marginalized Veterans in American History, which is forthcoming from the UMass Press. Please help me welcome Jason Higgins. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. I want to give a special thanks to a couple of uh, audience members. Uh, John Kinder is here. He's the co-editor of the book mentioned. Uh, Matt Becker is here as well. He's the editor-in-chief of UMass Press. And Dr. Elizabeth Grubgeld, who was my thesis advisor as a master's student at Oklahoma State University. And if I missed anyone, I do apologize. I've, I see a couple of familiar faces out there. I can't see everyone though. Um, without further ado, I think I'll just jump right in. Um, if anyone has questions and you find a good uh, breathing moment to ask them, feel free to jump in. Um, a couple of things, I I'll probably read more than I normally feel comfortable doing during a presentation for the reason that I like to um, amplify the voices of the people that I'm talking about. So I will be quoting directly from them. At one point, I will um, share a YouTube link. There will be a three minute video um, and I will signify that. I'll put the link in the comment so you can watch it on your own to avoid any technical difficulties. Without further ado, I think I'll get started. Let me share my screen with you. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so the first part of this actually draws pretty directly from the introduction of our book. Um, I'll just get started. The year 2020 brought several ongoing problems and divisions faced in the veteran communities out of the margins of society and into the open. The tragic death of Vanessa Guillen exposed the alarming incidents of sexual violence in the military. It is estimated that one in three women in the military experienced sexual assault. COVID-19 furthermore exposed the inequities faced in veteran communities. As many of you know, here in Western Massachusetts, over 100 veterans died from the first wave of the coronavirus at the Holyoke Soldiers Home, further exposing the precarious lives of certain veteran groups. And while veterans are venerated in the halls of Congress, many continue to survive with minimal support, oftentimes beyond the realm of public reception and acknowledgement. And yet veterans are not a single homogenous group. Some are more vulnerable than others, a reality reinforced by divisions in American society, racial, gender, and economic inequality. Like all of the veterans you will hear about today, Hector Barajas, join the US Army for social rewards, to escape the confines of his life as an undocumented immigrant, to seek opportunities, education, career benefits, and training, and to serve the nation. Rahas believed that the Army would provide a pathway to citizenship and a way out of poverty and gang life in Compton, California. It was the best decision of my life, he says. As an elite member of the 82nd Airborne, Barajas served honorably from 1995 to 2001, 
earning the rank of E4 specialist. And while the Army provided opportunities beyond the limited life he had known in California, he could not escape his past. While he was living on base, Hector was exposed to a culture that encouraged binge drinking, and he started using drugs. Once his habits started to affect his work, Hector had the good sense to seek help. He checked himself into a rehabilitation program. It was the right choice, but then the substance use became part of his army records. Then Hector relapsed, just as many users inevitably do. The attacks on September 11th, 2001 occurred, and as a member of special forces, <clears throat> Barajas planned for the worst. But what happened to him was far worse than he could have possibly imagined. In October 2001, just one month later, the army chaptered him out of the military. Hector tried to fight it, but he had no choice. He was forced out of the army. The support networks on which he had come to rely, the support services and the kinship he had formed were stripped away. Within two months, Hector was incarcerated. And apparently there's construction going on in my office for which I could not have possibly planned. Hopefully no one can hear it. <laughs> it's very distracting to me though. Hector's former life in Compton caught, caught up with him. He had moved back home to stay with his parents and not much had changed. He fell back into the same old problems. His marriage started to deteriorate. He drank more heavily and used cocaine. Then one day, he got into a vehicle with an old friend from high school. On a drug deal gone bad, someone fired a weapon. No one was injured, but Hector was charged with attempted murder. He struck a plea bargain and served three years in prison. When his time was up, Hector was transported from a prison to an immigration detention center where he was picked up by US Marshals. And then he was deported to Mexico in 2004. Hector had felt more alien in Mexico than the US. Although he had joined the army as a path towards citizenship, his military service made little difference. In the criminal justice system, Hector was a quote unquote illegal. From Tijuana, Hector started organizing other deported US military veterans and founded the Disabled Veterans Support House in 2010. The DVSH is a grassroots political movement that supports and advocates for the repatriation of hundreds of deported veterans. More than that, it is a community of veterans living in exile, excluded from the benefits afforded to other veterans and completely reliant upon one another. Hector says, quote, the work that we do, it definitely heals. At the house, we're able to connect guys with rehab centers. We have volunteer counselors. We've had toy drives, Christmas dinners, birthday celebrations. I think that helps. He says that hope can keep you alive, even if for just that one day. COVID-19 has been especially hard on deported veterans and their fights for daily survival. After years of organizing and appealing his status, Hector was granted US citizenship in 2018, and he continues to advocate, raise funds, and support hundreds of other green card veterans. In 2020, he met with two-time Democratic presidential hopeful, Bernie Sanders, and has met with Senator Tammy Duckworth to advocate for political legislation to advance their cause. Sharing their life experiences also helps to raise public awareness, which has had a significant impact on the community. As mentioned, since 2017, I've conducted nearly 60 interviews with veterans formerly incarcerated. Some of them uh, were police officers, some of them were judges even. Um, this project seeks to understand the relationship between trauma and incarceration. Each chapter of my dissertation and my forthcoming manuscript project um, will explore the historical effects of personal or collective trauma on various groups of veterans. As you can see here, I've kind of laid out 
um, the various topics that my research covers. Mostly what you'll be hearing about today are African-American Vietnam veterans with disabilities and some of the reasons why they inevitably end up in the prison system. Um, I'll also be exploring the, the impact of the war on drugs, especially on African-American veterans. And then near the end of the presentation, I'll come back and talk about um, Iraq war veterans and PTSD and the denial of, of trauma symptoms and manhood. Um, here's an important fact. Um, by 1978, a quarter of the prison population was veterans, a disproportionate number of whom were black. This is one out of four veterans in the United States, uh, one out of four of the prison inmates in the United States in 1978, only five years after the war in Vietnam ended, were military veterans. This is on the brink of mass incarceration. And since then, while the prison populations have grown exponentially, only uh, veterans have doubled, which seems um, like a lot. But whenever you consider that maybe 200,000 veterans are in the prison system and maybe 2.4 million people are in the prison system, these disparities uh, become very clear. So I wanna keep that in mind. While I'm talking about veterans today, we should all be aware of the ongoing problems in the criminal justice system that disproportionately impact African-Americans. I wanna tell you about the story of Henry David Burton. Born the, soul of a, uh, born the son of a coal miner in West Virginia, Henry David Burton joined the Marine Corps for the promises of opportunity and experiences. Like hundreds of thousands of teenage boys before and since him, Burton underwent a Marine Corps rite of passage into manhood. He says, they break you down to nothing. I mean, you're not even an individual. They broke me down. When they gave me a pair of socks and pants, I thought I had a tuxedo. They looked good. I remember coming out of the camp thinking I could take on the whole world. I went to Louisiana and my chest stuck out so bad, I couldn't wait to get to Vietnam to kill me some gooks, he said apologetically. Quote, that's how my, my uh, frame of mind was at the time. In late 1967, Henry Burton arrived in Da Nang. It had a peculiar smell, he says. I'll never forget it. I can still smell the atmosphere. It was different. I know what it was now. It was death that I was smelling and the people were smaller. They looked strange to me, but death was in the air. He said, it still lingers today of death. Burton arrived by himself, the only one from his platoon to be shipped to Vietnam. He had orders to join the 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines. He says, I had to wait because they was out in the bush. And while I was waiting, that's when my father died and I came back home. Burton's father died of black lung disease. He had been a coal miner. He flew home to attend the funeral. And while he was back stateside, Henry met Marquette, the woman who became his wife and the mother of his child. Mourning and concern for the family, Burton filed for a hardship discharge from the Marine Corps. He says because he was the oldest one in the family, the appeal was denied. He rejoined the 1st Battalion, 5th Marines in 1968 on the eve of Tet. Henry first experienced combat in Hue. He says, I fell in love with it and I stayed there. He says, I stayed a total of 19 months and in Vietnam, I became a different person. Over the next year, Burton's body and behavior adapted to the conditions of war, periods of boredom, searching for an elusive enemy, and then shattered by intense moments of violence, killing, and loss. At war, Burton learned to survive by isolating himself. He created emotional distances between himself and the other men. He says, when I got to Vietnam, I was the only one in my platoon. So I had to make friends with the men I met, and I met quite a few. He came to expect the sudden death by ambush. He says, 
when we got new men in the platoon, we really didn't care about them because they wouldn't survive long enough. I lost that compassion for human beings. Afterwards, Henry Burton found it difficult to reconcile his losses in a senseless war. I can remember the face of death, he says, but memorializing is a conflicting process for him. He says, if my friends died, I couldn't think about them. All I could think about was the living. The dead had no meaning. The strategies that helped Burton survive in combat were detrimental to his life in civilian society. And he's felt alone ever since. One fragmented memory continues to haunt Henry's dreams. Whenever I interviewed Henry, he asked me for permission to follow a, a schedule a schedule a follow-up interview. This is the reason why he wanted to tell me this story. He says, they hit us on the bridge on the way to Hui City. He said, after the combat, they asked me to go to a place where all the dead bodies was to identify the men from our platoon. I get there and it's like a football field of bodies from one end to the other. There wasn't a path in between, so you have to step on the bodies to get to the people to identify them. I remember stepping on these bodies and I kept saying, excuse me, excuse me. But yet I had no feelings for them at the time. All kinds, races in different countries had been killed. That still haunts me today. Henry was wounded three different times in Vietnam. He, said, he says after receiving a third Purple Heart, he was administratively discharged by the Marine Corps despite his appeals to stay. He wanted to stay in Vietnam and continue. Quote, they give them three chances to kill you. If they can patch you up, they send you back into combat. But if you lose an arm or a leg or something critical, then they send you home. But if they can patch you back up, then they give them three chances to kill you. After a third time, they may take you out of the field. He says, so that's how I got out of the field the third time. Burton was suddenly booted out of the Marines with no time for adjustment, no job training and no support. I didn't know anything about disability, he said. I didn't know anything about the VA. On April 15th, 1970, he was back in the United States, but was quote, stuck with a wife, a child, no job, nothing, stuck. After the war, Henry and his wife moved to Detroit, but undiagnosed and unrecognized trauma permanently destroyed his marriage and his family. In 1972, Henry left and moved to Roanoke, Virginia. He bounced around from employment services and various jobs, but hit a dead end, he says. I had only two marketable skills, combat and working in a supermarket. He said, that's how I ended up turning into crime. No one was hurt. And it was his first offense, but based on the nature of his crimes and his military service record, the court sentenced him to 15 years in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. In the criminal justice system, Mr. Burton had always been a black male, first and foremost. If his veteran status mattered, it did not help his case. If anything, it made him look even more dangerous. Henry recounted the trial in the interview. He said, the judge gave me life. And my lawyer said, your honor, he never killed nobody. The judge responded, he's dangerous. Get him out of my courtroom. It looked like my military service became my enemy. All I did was take the money, but that still didn't matter. His military record makes him dangerous, he recalled. It was not that Mr. Burton was simply a combat veteran from an unpopular war. Henry Burton was a black man who had been an agent of state violence. He says, I joined the military because I believed in our country and almost died three times. He asked, you would die for a country and then come back and break the laws you're ready to die for? What happened to me? He keeps asking himself. But that's not a question, he said. I broke the law, but why do I get life? Give me another life, he repeated. Give me another life. Over the last few decades, Mr. Burton became institutionalized. He says, I think in the early part of prison, I became a prisoner of war. 
In my mind, that's how I coped. He learned to survive in prison by isolating himself, much like he did in Vietnam. My post-traumatic stress went dormant, he says, and went to sleep on me. After serving 14 years, Burton was released. Once more, the veteran came home to the world, but the PTSD resurfaced. He recidivated. Since then, Burton has fought for his recognition as a and his status as a US military veteran. He now receives 100% disability benefits for combat-related PTSD and a lifetime of trauma. Pain with regrets, he said, I've been buried in prison the last 40 years. Mr. Burton's currently out on parole. He's living with his brother. Excuse me. I want to talk now about, um, well, according to the Department of Justice, apparently almost 60% of veterans in prison have been convicted of a violent crime, o only less than 10% on drug charges. This is the complete opposite of civilian society, actually. Most uh, civilians are incarcerated on drug crimes. The end of the Vietnam War also marked the beginning of the war on drugs. When Nixon gave his speech that launched the drug war, he scapegoated heroin addicted soldiers for US military losses in Vietnam. And while in actuality, only 10% of soldiers in Vietnam reported use of heroin, the political rhetoric created a lasting stigma on Vietnam veterans. As many veterans readjusted to life in the United States, many dealt with undiagnosed and unrecognized trauma oftentimes by drinking alcohol and using drugs. The punitive drug laws enacted under the Nixon administration and further es escalated by the Reagan administration entrapped a generation of military veterans who were coping with mental health issues. So I'm gonna stop there for a second. I'm gonna put, oh, let me stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna put a link into the chat and you can watch this on your own and I'll watch it quietly as well and time it. And we'll meet back here in around three minutes.
I want to be sure to give plenty of time for it to wrap up. You're muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, that's good. Thank you. And can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, I can see it. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> After the violent assault, Mr. Fennell's attackers were not reprimanded. But Fennell experienced retaliation from the commanding officer who denied his scheduled promotion. He says, I thought it was reprehensible, he remembered. The injustice was eye-opening. Before that point, Fennell had not gotten into any problems in the military. But afterwards, he was stationed right next to a morgue and, quote, was seeing dead body bags every day. Drugs were readily available in Okinawa and the military encouraged a culture of drinking. He began to use heroin before his discharge and it worsened after he got home. He says, reintegration was very traumatic because I was unable to communicate the things that had occurred over there because I thought it was so horrendous to be beat up, degraded. I couldn't talk to my wife. I tried to heal myself. I started using. After his discharge, he, quote, shied away from any affiliation with the military because of the shame, unquote. I got caught up in the drug game, he says. I tried to work, but drugs became overwhelming. So I became a full-time addict. He remembered the insidiousness of the drug takes over. You have absolutely no control to the point that your freedom is in jeopardy. It destroyed his family relationships to the point that he decided that it would be better to leave. He says, quote, I was first incarcerated when I was 28 years old as a direct result of my addiction. It creeps in and nothing really matters but me and the drug. The family takes second or third place. I did love my family. I do love my family, he says, but it was up and down, gels, bells, fells for me. Haywood Fennell Sr. spent a total of two decades in prison for drug-related crime. In the 1990s, he finally stopped using heroin. He went to the VA for the first time in his life. Now I want to live, he says. I went through the withdrawals and got myself thinking that I could stand on my own two feet. I didn't have anything left to lose because I had lost everything. My family, I've got a record. I've been to prison. What else is there for me to do but to stand up? That was 21 years ago. It took me 28 years to get my college degree. He said, alluding, education is a weapon for change. Incarcerated veterans experience intergenerational trauma. Fennell explains, if you had 100,000 veterans from the Vietnam War era whose parents were incarcerated, leaving kids at home, and say they got a stretch of 10 years, leave a kid at eight and come back at 15. You try to become a father. You're trying to reclaim the collateral damage of your being incarcerated. A lot of these people today in their 20s, 30s and 40s had veterans as parents and grandparents. They didn't get that wholesomeness that's needed. And that prevents them from being parents. So now you've got these Vietnam era veterans, their children, and their grandchildren caught in the cycle. Mr. Fennell's incarceration had an immeasurable impact on his own children and his grandchildren. His son, Haywood Fennell Jr. served a prison sentence at 18 years old. His life was cut tragically short by complications of HIV AIDS. Mr. Fennell's daughter works as a captain at Rikers Island. Their lives are caught in an undertow, pushed and pulled by the military and prison industrial complexes. Today, Haywood Fennell Sr. volunteers in this community to fill the absence left by a generation of African-American 
people in prison during the war on drugs. The son of a Vietnam War veteran, David Carlson, has lived in the wake of an intergenerational trauma, war, and incarceration. He was born into an environment of poverty, violence, and drug use. He says, my dad is from Mississippi. He's my black side, Carlson said. My dad's a Vietnam vet. He was also an infantryman. After Vietnam, he got into a criminal lifestyle. When I was born, he was a pimp. My mom was a prostitute. David's father, Abra Hayes, had a brutal life in the Jim Crow South. As a child, he witnessed the lynching. David says they were extremely poor. He went to Vietnam and got shot. He had a hard time coming home. After his discharge, Hayes returned to Jackson, Mississippi, where he was harassed by local police and still treated as a second-class citizen. David says he moved to California because it was a little better for black people, but he could never beat the alcohol and drug addiction. And that's what led to the pimping. David Carlson grew up amid instability, domestic violence and drug use. He moved schools frequently. At age 13, Carlson got involved in gang violence. By age 14, he was incarcerated in a juvenile detention center. By age 20, David sought structure, community, and discipline. Not too long after 9-11, he joined the Army National Guard. Carlson deployed to Iraq in 2004 and volunteered for a second deployment in 2007. Today, he suffers from survivor's guilt and post-traumatic stress disorder. David says, when Sergeant Alwyn Cash got killed, that was two weeks before we left country. We had got taken off the mission when he was killed. David said it was like we betrayed them. Carlson remembered, that's the end of my tour and that's it. There was no retribution for it. That happened and then I'm home. He explained that stuck with me my entire time and that's why I volunteered a second deployment. During his second tour in Iraq, psychiatric trauma took a heavy toll on Carlson. As a soldier, however, David Carlson equated mental illness with weakness, a failure of manhood. He says, I didn't believe in PTSD at that time. I had one buddy. During the first two weeks in Iraq, he got hit by an RPG. Carlson recalled the shrapnel went through both his feet and he got sent back. I found out later that he had all these issues. He was an alcoholic and I got home and saw him. In my mind, I thought he was just weak. And then after my second tour, I started having those same issues. After everything Carlson had been through, he believed, quote, if I was walking around with the appearance that I'm fine, then you should be too. He thought, if you're a man, you're not going to have issues with this, period. When he returned the, to the United States after the second tour in Iraq, Dar David Carlson started to lash out violently. One night, Carlson aimed a loaded weapon at police, daring them to kill him. He was arrested and confined to a VA psychiatric ward. Carlson entered a, PTS treat, a PTSD treatment program at Fort Knox. Then he was kicked out of the National Guard. Afterwards, his mental health conditions worsened without the support of the military. He was arrested for burglary. While on probation, he was arrested again this time for operating under the influence. He had been involved in a veteran treatment court program, but the judge rejected him, kicked him out and sentenced him to a previous three year prison sentence. In total, David Carlson served 22 months in combat and over four years in prison. While incarcerated, he became more violent and undermined prison authority. He admitted, I was a predator, my whole plan was to get out and hurt the community. I wanted to destroy it. I hated the United States and I hated everybody. That's the way I was released and I only lasted a few months. He remembered, I ran from the cops. I was combative. I'm fortunate to not have life in prison or be dead. 
Carlson recidivated and spent nine months in solitary confinement. He says, at first, I thought it was going to destroy me, but it made me access a strength that I used to turn my life around. He started writing. He reached out to a mentor at the VA who helped him publish his writings. And through this process, he discovered his calling for advocacy work. He now advocates for a nonviolent reparative uh, model for criminal justice reform. He's now a volunteer mentor at a veteran treatment court in Minnesota. He's graduated from college and he's a father. Veterans of the forever wars experience unique problems that stem from the nature of war in the 21st century. Multiple deployments, traumatic brain injuries, and increased rates of suicide. While the Army provides more sophisticated reintegration programs and various mental health services, cultural change has been slower to meet the challenges. Men and women in the military fear stigmas, retaliation, and career consequences for reporting military-related traumas. Their fears are not unfounded. One report revealed that 22,000 soldiers were kicked out of the military for misconduct. According to the Department of Defense, all of them had been deployed to either Iraq or Afghanistan, sometimes both. Each of them were diagnosed with PTSD, traumatic brain injuries, or other mental health issues. Again, 22,000. While the Army reformed its policies on issuing other than honorable discharges in 2007, military health professionals have operated in discriminatory ways to deny treatment or dismiss mental health as unrelated to their military service, such as personality disorders or pre existing conditions, which deny veterans treatment through the VA and sometimes education benefits. As a result of systemic and cultural barriers, many personnel do not report issues at all, and their problems only become worse once they leave the military, often leading to incarceration. Beyond the military, veterans themselves have formed powerful agent advocacy groups and grassroots movements to provide more services, benefits, and legislation reform. Vietnam veterans have spearheaded these efforts. The collective memory of estrangement, rejection, or betrayal has led many Vietnam veterans to dedicate their lives to supporting one another. The veteran treatment courts have formed out of this sense of abandonment. Their motto, leave no veteran behind, exemplifies their camaraderie and solidarity with veterans in legal troubles. Since the founding of Veteran Treatment Court in 2008, more than 400 of these courts have grown across the United States and thousands of Vietnam veterans across the country volunteer as mentors, oftentimes uh, being these figures that just dedicate their time to helping Iraq and Afghanistan war veterans. More than that, these courts provide a one-stop shop to veterans in the criminal justice system. They provide access to the VA. They actually have a, a VA liaison in the court system. That's revolutionary. In 2008, whenever they had the VA, a federal entity, enter the state court system, that was something unheard of previously. They provide counseling services, drug rehabilitation, support for housing, education, discharge upgrades, disability, disability benefits, and more. Veteran treatment courts have the lowest recidivism rates in the nation. In short, veteran treatment court is the model for criminal justice reform because it treats the underlying conditions of crime instead of punishment. And yet, justice is not equal. Veteran treatment court depends on state laws excludes certain crimes and their defendants, and requires a certain level of privilege and means to even finish the programs. A lot of the time, these guys have to meet every week. For people who work or don't have transportation, that's incredibly difficult. And I'm gonna wrap up here, and hopefully everyone's still with me. I know that was kind of a long period. Um, several cities across the United States, such as Buffalo, where the first veteran treatment court was founded in 2008, Philadelphia, where I was interviewing veterans in 2019, New York City, where I was interviewing Hector Barajas, 
and even Tulsa, Oklahoma, the second veteran treatment, where the second veteran treatment court was founded in 2009, were the scenes of brutal police violence over the summer of 2020. These very cities are the most progressive criminal justice uh, systems in the country, and they're plagued with racial violence. During the George Floyd protests, Buffalo riot police shoved a 75 year old protester causing him severe brain injuries. When police were reprimanded, 57 of them threatened to resign from their posts. This past week in February, 2021, a grand jury dismissed charges against the accused officers. It is not a coincidence that police violence against African-Americans continues in cities known for progressive reforms. And one of the most heartbreaking occurrences of this reality, a US Army veteran named Elliot Williams died in a Tul Tulsa County jail. Williams had a documented history of mental health issues. The veteran died of sustained blunt force trauma and starvation. His neck had been broken. The attending nurse and jail psychiatrist accused William of faking his injuries. For six days, he was denied medical attention. Surveillance ca uh, cameras captured the degradation and abuse he endured. Guards taunted Williams as he lay dying. This tragic incident happened in the city where the second veteran treatment court was founded. Did the veteran status of Elliot Williams matter? In prison, you don't have veterans, answers Henry David Burton, only convicts and inmates. Sorry if that was intense. I'm an intense person. <laughs> wow, that was. I'd love to hear. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that was really intense. <laughs> um, amazing that these things are still still taking place, but you can see how um, compassion is what's needed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And empathy and an awareness from the public, because I think all too often we allow these problems to go unnoticed. Um, I'd love to hear your questions or your thoughts, your concerns, any feedback whatsoever, either private message or in chat. Um, can you just remind me, Jason, how, how many interviews have you done? 60? Is that For this particular project since 2017, I've done 60 interviews. Um, I've done about 100 in total since uh, around 2011, from veterans from World War II to Iraq and Afghanistan and everywhere in between. And I'm just curious how you how you've found these folks. Have um, yeah, how, how do you find people who are willing to talk to you about their experiences? Not easily. Yeah, um, it takes a lot of work and a lot of help from people who support this project. Uh, social media has been really effective. Uh, I've, I've been helped out. Um, I don't know if she's here. I hope she is. Mary Ellen Salzano. Um, she might not be here, but she, she wanted to come. She's on the West Coast, and she helped me connect with people on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, social media, again, has just been really great at getting this out. And while at first I was actively seeking people out, eventually people started hearing about my project and they came to me wanting these stories to get told. And honestly, that makes me feel um, in a better position ethically because you know they want their stories out there. I'm not extracting these stories from people. I, um, yeah. Yeah. Other, other questions from audience members? I can't uh, see all of you. I have a comment. My audio. Can you hear me? Yes. You're a little bit quiet, but we can hear you. Um, so the the problem is a lot of this. I mean, we're focused on you know the rank and file here, but unfortunately, this goes right to the very top, where uh, you know a presidential candidate like uh, Kerry can be accused of uh, the swift voting, you know, comments and. Uh, then we had uh, President Trump saying that uh, McCain was a loser 
that you know he wasn't a war hero because he was captured and he didn't like people who were captured. It's like the disrespect seems to go right to the very top. I agree. You know, there is this tendency to venerate veterans in the halls of Congress while ignoring the radiating effects of these forever wars on their lives. You know, they're voting against the interest of people um, like Eugene Goodman, you know, uh, in Congress just last week, he was, uh, they voted unanimously, I believe, to give him um, a medal. And yet, Half the half the Congress, um, you know, voted against his own interest. So I, I completely agree with that. We do have, a, and yet, a, sorry, go, sorry, go ahead. And yet, there there are still, you know, uh, senators out there advocating for these guys, meeting with people like Hector Barajas, I mean, Tammy Duckworth. Bernie Sanders, and it's not just on the left. I think that there's there's real genuine support across the communities, despite uh, you know some of these 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 people in power who, who maybe don't deserve to be there. Sorry, there was an, maybe another question. Yeah, there was a question in the chat uh, from L. Have veteran services groups been helpful in locating interviewees? Yeah, that's a really good question, Leon. How are you doing? <laughs> um, yes, to, a, to an extent. Oftentimes, whenever I'm reaching out to these veteran treatment courts, which have been a really effective way for me to get in touch with people currently involved in the treatment court, a lot of the times, you know, and rightfully so, they're, they're, they're not very trustful at first. So a lot of the times I interview them. And they understand and they talk with me or they talk with me over the phone and they understand that my intentions are, 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 are good inevitably. Um, and that, you know, first again, I interview them and then they introduce me to another veteran and then it avalanches from there. And that's, that's how oral history goes as some of you have done this probably know. You, you gotta make a connection, you gotta get into the communities and you gotta talk to people. Um, there have been people, especially people involved with the prison system themselves, who have been very guarded about it. Though I won't be, I won't lie. Uh, there is a tendency to want to protect uh, the prison system, as, as some of you might not be surprised. Dr. Grubgo, I see. I saw that since 2006, 76,000 vets have been chaptered out. Is that the high post Vietnam? Is it an attempt to save money by denying? benefits? That's a great question. And a lot of veterans believe so. Yes, a lot of veterans themselves believe that um, other than honorable discharges or being chaptered out or being kicked out is a possible way for the military to not only absolve themselves of the problems that oftentimes are created in the military, but also save them from a lifetime of veteran benefits. So yes, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I don't know if everybody would though. Love to hear some more questions. I'm, I'm curious about your um, interviewing techniques and uh, if are the folks, have you spoken with folks who are still actively in prison and how, how do you coordinate that? That must be a nightmare to try to get phone interviews and things so this is a dilemma that i've that i've had um i have done interviews with presently incarcerated veterans with following proper procedure through individual institutions for example the northampton county jail uh, i've interviewed inside that facility um, one of the head correctional officers is a veteran of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan himself. So a lot of the times there are veteran pods and there are people who really want to help these guys. However, I, as much as I attempt to explain informed consent and try to keep their identities private for fear of any kind of repercussions, I still feel very uh, concerned about that and have not published or put on the internet anything uh, 
involving a currently incarcerated veteran for, for privacy reasons, for ethical concerns. You know, uh, oral history is now classified alongside with journalism. So you don't require IRB approval. However, I've basically dedicated the last several years of my life to understanding how trauma impacts people, not just a listener, but someone who talks about trauma. And on the one hand, it can be a good thing to be interviewing veterans who are already in, in counseling services. They have access to the VA, they have systems in place to help them with that. And that relieves some of my concerns. On the other hand, a lot of these people have never shared their stories before. You know, they're, they're sharing stories with me that they don't feel comfortable sharing with their own family members. You know, so that, that it creates quite a dilemma if I'm, if I'm being quite honest with you. But I think that, you know, oral historians have what we call shared authority. So anything that um, gets on the transcript gets reviewed by these people and they have the final authority on that. And I think that that helps. But again, there's a lot of what I'm doing um, is in the gray. And I think that someone could probably take advantage of that as good as my intentions are, right? So I see Leon says, that has been my experience as well, although they seem to interview me first. And once I meet their approval, they speak with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you, mean, do you mean other veterans or do you think, or do you mean someone interviewing you? No, uh, I've done it with veterans and also oddly enough with uh, some older union members. And when you first approach them, they, like you said, are kind of apprehensive. They don't necessarily want to talk to you. And I found if I sit there and let them interview me and find out about me, they become more relaxed and then they will talk to me. I am a veteran. So I have that little piece of, commonality with them and we start talking and you know about me what I did and what I do when I got out of the military and all those kind of things and then eventually we get around to them and then they're more relaxed and they'll start talking to me and telling me you know their story when I've, I've talked to them so it's a fascinating dynamic yeah I like I like this idea of letting them interview me first and I think that's essentially what they're doing you know they're 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 given they're they're doing an interview with me. They want to know where my intentions lay. Um, and, yeah. you know, I'm not a veteran myself. I don't know if I, I didn't say that throughout this presentation. I'm not a veteran. Um, and so there is even that added layer of maybe suspicion, um, especially with the Vietnam generation. You know, a lot of these guys came home um, feeling quite rejected by their communities. Uh, so there is that added layer of distrust. I, um, I never pressure them to, uh, to do an interview with me. If, if they seem apprehensive at all, I don't do it. I don't even seek it. And I explain this all of this up front before I even have them sign anything. I write an invitation letter. I explain all of this. I try to be as transparent as possible. And I think that that is really key here. I think you got to be transparent with people. Furthermore, you know, I tell them, like, look, I'm not a veteran, but I've dedicated the last 10 years of my life to trying to understand the experiences of veterans, even if I can never really know what it's like to be in war or in prison, because I've never, I've never been in either one. Um, and then I think that, you know, they step into this teacher role. You know, I'm a student still. I don't know how this will change after I get my PhD, but for now, I'm still a student. And they step into this teacher role and they're willing to share these things with me. Um, and again, I, I let them review whatever they share with me. And if they have anything in there, they don't feel comfortable sharing in public. And I tell them, like, just presume everyone is going to see this, even if no one does. Uh, if there's anything in there you don't want the public to know, it's not a problem. I'll delete it. Um, I think we're out of time. But, you know, if it, so if anyone needs to, to leave now, that's completely fine um but if anyone wants to ask more questions i'm happy to answer them i think we had a hand up from uh Shafi. yes um so yeah i noticed we had gone an hour and i wasn't sure how much longer you wanted to go uh, i'm glad that you mentioned that you're not a veteran and i'm almost glad you mentioned it at the end of the program because i think i certainly assumed that you were a veteran and i'm not sure how many people here thought the same uh, most of I, I'm the guy who went to college. I mean, and I flirted with them entering the military out of high school and three other times, you know, as an adult until, of course, I was too old to do that. But most of the male members of my family have been in the military 
uh, World War II, I mean, um, Navy, Army, brother-in-law, Marine Reserve. My brother was in the Army. And uh, he did not see combat. He took what they called the Vietnam tour. He dropped out of high school, uh, or the Germany tour, I'm sorry. It's, they called it the Germany tour. And uh, after basic training, you're sent to Germany for a year, and then you go to Vietnam. But fortunately for him, Vietnam was winding, winding down at that time. So he still has a lot of anger, though. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, probably for other reasons. And he he's in a very good spot right now, because uh, actually, uh, just for our personal circumstances and how our lives have factored out, uh, he, he's actually receiving more in veterans the benefits uh, than I am from any other source from the government. <laughs> and so he's in a good spot right now and just basically trying to, uh, you know, live his life and, uh, and be happy, as, as happy as he can. So uh, I just wanted to, to add that, that, you know, we're all in different situations where we served or did not serve we have intimates who served or did not serve, maybe some who have died in combat, uh, did not come back, or as, as you say, this program emphasizes those who have been incarcerated and whose lives have been destroyed by uh, circumstances related to the military. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that most Americans' lives are shaped inherently by our wars, even if sometimes we don't recognize it or even know it. Um, and that may be changing, you know, there's a smaller percentage of Americans who know someone who's serving because the percentage of Americans in the military has decreased. I don't know what that means for the future. I just got to follow up and ask you now, then you opened up a can of worms. Oh, I don't shit. believe in the volunteer military. I believe in two years of mandatory service for all American citizens. It doesn't have to be military. That could be an option, could be just national service. Peace Corps, VISTA, whatever. There's a way, there's so much work that needs to be done. And I know even as a young man, uh, I actually took a year off from college and I went to Germany for a year where my brother was, was stationed and I actually lived with him off, off base. He had a, uh, an apartment off base at that point. So, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, we talk about junior year abroad or in college or uh, a lot of colleges are saying uh, have what they call a wait year before you enter college. You know, we accept you, but wait, you know, to mature a little bit. I know even after high school, I was sick and tired of school. And believe me, when I got to graduate school, I was sick and tired of school. I wanted to get out. I couldn't stand it. And, uh, you know, my last um, term paper, my last um, uh, final, you know, I thought that was it. Well, I was wrong, of course. And education is a continuing journey. But uh, just just a couple of thoughts there at random. What do you think about an, uh, an all-volunteer military? Should we have it? Is it, a, is it a good thing? Or are we causing more problems? You know, I'm going to deflect on this one, kind of like a politician, and just say that, you know, I spent five years between high school and college. <laughs> I, I poured concrete, uh, I did concrete construction. I think that that prepared me and made me a more mature person. And I was ready to take on the significant uh, debts, uh, both financial and social of going to school for 10 years. But um, I don't know, you know, I'd like to live in a world where we, where no one needs to serve in the military, to be honest with you. But that's, I, I realize that that's an idealized world. Well, thank you so much, Jason. This is really, really important work you're doing and looking forward to seeing your finished dissertation. That sounds fascinating. Um, and yeah, as someone who's pretty much disconnected from the military, um, really insightful to see the way things are operated, what, you th what the media shows you and how things really are sounds like completely disconnected, so yeah. Well, I want to take one more opportunity to, uh, you know, acknowledge John Kinder, who's here. He's the co-editor of our forthcoming co-edited volume that's under review with the UMass Press. Um, hopefully I can share that whenever it's ready. Um, and uh, again, Dr. Grabgill, thank you so much for attending. Uh, both of these people have really influenced my scholarship in, in profound ways. 
Great. Thank you, everyone. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at another presentation and um, good luck with your work, Jim.